so how to render details um, let's look at the notes for today that I made for you okay so technically 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 what you guys are asking me is how do I show that something has more information in it than my brushes have sort of approached um, my net don't like YouTube it's okay X so there are different ways to add detail detail can be added by using a brush so brush is one way to add detail and your brush can provide you with information that will make it look like you have added more work than you really have so t sometimes we don't have as much work um, we don't have as much time to do the to do the work and so we need a brush to help us approach that so the brush over here this brush so this is the technique understand the unit that you're painting what is it the unit requirements are EQ okay <clears throat> second thing is what kind of surface area texture are we looking at so the unit requirements they lead us to a texture so what kind of texture and can you duplicate that texture through a brush after you get the brush what do you do you vary and this is sort of I'm working in grayscale and I don't want to overwhelm you but you vary the details through color but I'm not going to talk about color just yet and how to get details I'm going to leave it at this and I'm going to and there goes my phone and then what you do is after you get the unit requirements so let's say you're painting a tree or a tree uh, let's say this is a tree and you're painting the leaves then you think about the texture of the leaves so you're thinking about scattered small objects can be represented through a brush stroke but you don't have time to brush stroke every single little tree dot in there so what you do is you find a brush that will represent or replicate that distribution <clears throat> and then what you do after that is the sharpen tool so this is one way to get details after you're done the big picture and you want to get some details you just sharpen is that too loud you just sharpen the um, tree brushes yeah but they can look very fake very fast if you use tree brushes especially leaf brushes some leaf brushes I have they just stay in one position and I have to keep rotating the canvas to get like them in a different position and at that point I'm just like screw this uh, this is way too much this is more work than actually just using a brush stroke just to a brush to brush it in alright and then you use the sharpen tool the sharpen tool is a is a very miraculous tool if you use it on really high percentage you're gonna get something that looks very artificial um, if you just you know keep using it and overuse it and the sharpen tool once overused it just it's chaotic you don't want to overuse the sharpen tool this is basically sharpen tool overused and you can see that it's bringing out even the colors it's sharpening even the minuscule colors inside um, the data information of that brush stroke so this is an overuse of the sharpen tool. I'm just waiting for it to render. And um, even if you grayscale it, the texture still comes back. And it's very, very weird. If you want this texture, now you know how to get it. You just over sharpen. But when you use the sharpen tool in a very, very mediated way, what it does, it, it revives your brush strokes. It brings them back to life. So let's add a little bit more um, to this. Let's say I'm painting a brush, I mean a bush or a tree and let's add a little bit more here okay so this is one brush mimicking in a way I'm not I'm not trying to use the best three hour example for you but making mimicking the way leaves or organic leaves uh, organic units pro uh, distribute naturally so what the brush does, what the sharpen brush does in this one way of detailing is it revives the brush stroke so that we're not lo losing too much of the brush stroke. Let's say you use this really soft edged brush. Use the sharpen tool. Sharpen tool brings it out.
brings out the details in the corners, as you can tell. Let me zoom in for you. So Sharpen Tool isn't really painting for you. All you have to do, though, is, is turn on Protect Detail. If you don't turn on Protect Detail, um, it will start acting up. But this is sort of what the Sharpen Tool does. It revives the textures that are used inside so that it looks more rough and more detailed as if you actually spent time um, as much as required on that part of the tree. A lot of professionals use the Sharpen Tool um, and one of my favorite artists uses the Sharpen Tool and that's sort of what got me into using it. And it's, it's sort of, it's nice in variation. It's nice when you just uh, use it to a point where you can see your, your brushes or your strokes come out. So let's see it before the Sharpen Tool was used. Before, after, actually, no. Before, after. We, we, we sort of rediscovered the values as well as the separation between lights and darks. So that's one way to achieve detail in your paintings. And that's sort of um, an easier way to, to, to achieve it. Now we're trying to talk about grayscale at this point. Um, and uh, we're not really thinking about color uh, just yet. Because color, if you use variations in color, you get variations in detail. Um, and values and all of that. So the next way to do it, which is not a brush, is to use suggestive strokes. So let's say you're stuck with one brush, you want to only use one brush. Suggestive strokes means that what you've done Okay, sorry, moment of silence. <clears throat> Suggestive strokes means that uh, what you've done so far in the painting is that you've represented what the natural shape of the tree is. And you've represented it in a way where if you zoom out, it still makes sense and it still looks like a tree. But if you zoom in, you can see that there aren't as many details as there were when you zoom out. Um, but there is still a, an enough amount of, of detail that if you do zoom out, your eyes finish the rest of the work for you. Your eyes blend the colors together. You don't do all the work. You allow the, uh, the eyes to do the rest. So a suggestive sort of represent, representation of a tree. So let's find a good brush for this. It also requires a good brush, but let's say that we, we're stuck with one brush. Um, in real life, though, um, if you if you had to do this in real life, you wouldn't be stuck with one brush. You would you would be using a um, different brush as a fan brush for the leaves. You would be using a um, a, a larger brush for stippling, a thinner brush for the stems. But let's just say this is digital digital, and we can shrink and and enlarge our brushes. Okay, so this is called suggestive painting, where you keep the brush strokes large, but you, put, but you put them in the right spot. You put the values in the right spot. What does that mean? It's very difficult to find exactly exactly the right values to use, and um, a lot of people need references for that. And what, what I can say, if you don't want to use references, is build a really good visual library. But again, that's a difficult process as well. You have to look through a lot of trees. You have to practice um, a lot. But let's just say we're building a very basic very basic tree structure. So at this point, what you're doing is suggesting detail. You're not actually detailing. And this is the problem that some of you have. You guys paint a picture with a large brush, you keep everything nice and even, and then you're like, okay, now I want to detail and I don't even know where to start. You know, what do I detail first? What level of detail do I entertain? And uh, what you do is, at that point, you realize that from the beginning of this drawing, you're supposed to choose what level of detail you want to work with, and you work with that throughout the painting. Choose the final destination um, size. Choose the, the actual size you want to work with and stick with. So at this point, what I'm doing is suggesting value changes. Value is one way of painting suggest suggestively. So suggestive painting, which is a style of painting where you keep everything very large and impressionist, um, is the only thing that changes really is value. 
and you put the values in the right spot so, that, so it looks like the sun is hitting those areas just in the right spot and there's just the right amount of darkness. So actually let's take a look at Impressionist painting. Um, Okay, so what they do, basically the idea of Impressionist painting is that it's, it gives the impression of reali reality, but what it uses is very general strokes. Now can you see how this image can be duplicated by using the Sharpen tool? Do you guys understand? Um, yes, suggestive painting is the key to speed painting. It's also the key to master thumbnail paintings. Y you know, you look at all those people who have amazing thumbnail art, and what they do is uh, they really just think about the suggestive requirements, what's required for your eyes, what's required only, not what's excessive, not that extra bit of detail, what's required only. Most of the time, you only need the suggestive, which is why Impressionism was so widely accepted when it came out in the modernist era. It's because people didn't need all that crazy renaissance detail that was going on before so what they did was they saw this fresh new way of capturing color and capturing mood that that um, that it became very easy to become a prof um, an impressionist artist and it became even easier if you were already a professional artist to step back towards impressionism and that's basically what we're doing here when we do thumbnail art is that we're actually impressionists um, I know that Leventep entertains that degree as well. I really love his style. So look at how we can understand and relate to this. We see that it's water, but essentially it's very general strokes, a very general color. Do you remember when I told you that when in order to establish mood, you have to repeat a color in every single place of the painting. So there's a, a gentle pastel blue here, pastel blue here, pastel blue here, and pastel blue here. And that creates the general mist uh, or sunset time uh, or morning time feeling of this painting. Now let's look at this one. This one does not have a lot of detail in it at all, but it looks like it does. Um, if you guys can tell what it is. So it's a woman standing with an umbrella. Do you see how the change of detail, I mean the change of value creates the image of a of a shadow? I want all of you right now to uh, squint your eyes and look at this painting. You, your eyes will do the rest of the work for you. If you open your eyes, it'll barely seem like any of the detail is gone. So squint your eyes um, and look at everything all together and collectively understand how this painting doesn't need detail, but it's still working. It's still successful. Let me see if I can zoom up for you guys. And that's the wonderful thing about Impressionist work. If you zoom up, if you zoom out, still the same effect. So take a look at it. I'll give you like a couple seconds. So do you guys see how it successfully managed to create a mood and a... Um, I know, but it's too small. It's still too small, so... There you go. Um, uh, and do you see how it's managed to convince us that it's a woman on top of a of a grassy hill and there's someone behind her and they're both looking down and it brings to the question why are they looking there and that's all extra stuff but essentially as artists we see that this painter is a professional in their understanding of lighting and they understand that all you need is a shadow let's take this into, into deeper microscopic Um, analyzation, let's say, or observation. Okay, so rasterize. Do you see how white, the white is? It is no man's land, but it's working. Do you see how dark the dark is? Huge variation, but they've complemented each other. Why? Because he's successfully place them in the right spot. He didn't go and, and get away with himself and start, you know, placing the white everywhere. Do you see how that's sort of broken the symmetry of the lighting? It shrunk her, her, her dress. And that's sort of, as me personally, that's what I'm trying to achieve, to place the lights in the right spot. And and um, how he's managed to create values very well as as well as keep together the entire mood. So do you see how this color here is similar to this color here, which is similar to some of the blues here. I would suggest adding blues in this area, but there are blues here. 
in the greens. And the level of green there is, is a certain degree of blue, as you can find them. They're very, they're very delicate, delicately placed grays. And this is how you create mood as well as paint suggestively. This is suggestive painting. In other ways to say it, this is impressionist. And impressionism is essentially what it means to paint suggestively. You're suggesting the impression of the subject or the object that you're painting. So that's essentially what we're going to be doing here. Um, it's sort of getting a general... It's, Impressionist work doesn't take five minutes to finish. It actually takes a long time of observation to understand. So what you have to sort of start thinking about is which areas can I sacrifice and which areas will look like crap. So let's do this together. Let's see if this can work as an impressionist piece of work. And in the end of it, we will still have detail. And some of you are overrating detail. Some of you are... Um, saying that detail is what I need to get my picture drawn well. No! In order to be a good artist, you have to understand lighting. You have to understand quality. You have to understand uh, 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 value. And you have to understand all kinds of... of um, sorry. Um, you have to understand all kinds of, uh, of, of color combinations. And you have to understand perspective and 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 shading so you, you guys have to start thinking about is how can I duplicate a detailed image and create the same impression on my eyes without using that much detail and there's again I showed you two methods so far your brush can do that for you and that's just one basic digital technique that you can use of course you have to know where to put these brushes and what edge to put them right now they just look like microorganisms but, um, and the second way is where to place the values suggestively and how to make the picture work for you by understanding how things look realistically, removing from that degree of realism, and seeing what's left behind. So let's say, let's draw a map. Let's say at this point, this is zero detail. Picture has nothing in it. Blank canvas. We go down. And this is 100% detail. Realistic image. Okay? Where you want to be is right here. Sometimes even right here. Once you hit this and this, two things are going to start happening. First thing is your lack of understanding is going to show. So lack of knowledge. Challenged. Why? Why is it challenged? How does that make any sense? Well, this is from my experience anyway. If I'm getting to a point where I'm drawing a tree bark and um, the tree bark, I'm, I'm at a point where I'm zoomed in this much on the tree bark. At this point, from here to here, you're zoomed up this much into the tree bark. Let's say this was a tree bark, you're zoomed up this much. And you're trying to you're trying to put the lights in the right spot and you're trying to just even out, organize, okay, you go here, you guys go over here, I'm going to put a dark line here in between you and I'm going to make it look like a bark. Honestly speaking, to any of you, do any of you need this much detail? I mean, if you're doing fractal art, if you're doing digital, I mean, three-dimensional uh, modeling, if you're working on a movie where you have to start from scratch and to make it end up looking realistic like they did with the Spider-Man, the new Spider-Man movie, everything was rendered in that. Nothing was acting. Everything was real. I mean, um, fake in that, in the fight sequence in the high school. It's all fake. Um, it's, I mean, not fake. Like, it's all computerized. They required a shitload of detail, and what they did was get realistic duplicate um, textures in order to achieve that. Achieve that. So they're still um, anchored towards a realistic, uh, a realistic standpoint where they need photographs to help them. But do any of you really need this much detail to be zoomed in this much here? The only thing you need is up to here. At this point, the tree looks like this, just with general strokes. But you've placed those strokes not rudely or messily, but you've placed them strategically. This strategy, this approach, this very impressionist, professional, uh, uh, meditated, and, 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 uh, and, and sort of 
like anticipating detail, these kinds of strokes are what create an impressionist piece of work, are what is how you paint suggestively. You're suggesting the detail. Um, it's okay, Duran, thanks for coming. So, um, so this is essentially what I mean. When you're painting and you want to create something, not just a speedy, I know a lot of you want to make those professional looking speedies, but you can't make a speedy if you don't know everything yet. And nobody can really know everything, so what do you need to know in order to achieve this much, uh, this level in your work, these kinds of speedies, how do you make them? Um, so let's just find some to sort of inspire us. Okay, so this is a speed painting, and what we have here, do you see how rough his lines are? But when you zoom out, do you see how well they read? It's because he's placed these lights in the right spot. It's because he's, uh, he's the artist, whoever it is, he or she, has, has understood that I need this line here. Do you see these random lines that he's put for the river? They look very messy, but if you zoom away, they read very well. They read like uh, very shiny surfaces. As slanted as they are, it's okay. They, they still read as a painting of pillar-like objects near a wall-like structure with the sky as a separate part. Sometimes some of you merge the sky and you can't tell where the sky starts and where the land starts. So this is what I mean by Impressionist. This is Impressionist. This is, is, is under the guise of Impressionism. Um, which site? Digital Art Gallery separated by dashes.com. Digital dash art dash gallery. Um, and uh, uh, what he's, if this was in the modernist era where, where Impressionism first started to take, uh, take wing, um, this would have been counted as Impressionism, though they would not have understand these pillars um, as sales maybe. But that's technically what I mean. Let's look at others. Um, I know that there's some on DeviantArt, but I can't find them at this moment. Not those. Google's so useless. Okay, so let's look at Mr. Leventep here. I bring him a lot um, into this, into my explanations, but it's because I sort of want to explain uh, his level of quality. This is also Impressionist. Do you see how well it reads? How unbelievably detailed, yet not detailed this is? Number one, he uses, um, this is digital art, but he's duplicated, I think, through painter, the, the feeling of a, of a uh, canvas or the canvas texture. Um, and also, he's understood the values of distance. So do you, under, do you see how the building is distant? We zoom away, the building's just a bunch of strokes. And that's technically what I mean by suggestive painting. The more professional you are, the more you will understand what suggestive painting is. Look at this here. This is just a bunch of uh, rectangular, linear layers on layers, um, value differences, some sharpening here and here, erasing and sharp lines here and here, not a lot of smoothing, very suggestive cloud ranges in the back, and yet it reads as some massive ship, some massive... Um, uh, engine kind of of theme and he captures the mood perfectly. Do you see how the colors here are just similar to the colors here? Everything is within the same tones. Um, uh, some, some of these guys do use photographs. You can never really tell now because they've gotten so well at drawing photographs but it's because they're professional. They don't need to draw it anymore because they, they don't have time so they just throw in a picture that they took or they brought from a website. Um, uh, but essentially this is what I'm talking about. Now he barely does fully rendered work. He worked on swarm art as well, if you guys know about the swarm thing. 
This is another suggestive piece. It works. It works very well because he's placed the details in the right spot using extremely general strokes, extremely uh, messy approach, but not messy where it's just rowdy, it has no sense of anchoring, anchorage, but in a, in, a, in a way it's managed to create a sense of gravity, a sense of stacking, a sense of three-dimensionality. This is sort of detailed, so I can't really use this as an example. That's the swarm thing he worked on. Okay, here as well. Very readable, very understandable, but what he's done it through is is a is is very even even with this one, the values are just almost perfect. You zoom away, it seems like it's a photograph. Over here as well. Managed to create a very suggestive piece, yet still we see it's a painting. And when we look at something like this, we say, Oh, it's a painting. But why is it a painting? What's proving that it's a painting? It's because we can see the brush strokes, and the brush strokes are really important. Um, you can't over render. That's the next thing that I want to tell you guys. Over here, you're over rendering. When the picture is 100%, and you can't tell the difference between a photograph and that picture. Um, what is this? Oh, let me find a picture. Okay, there's a girl here. Okay, so over here is just this girl. And let me duplicate that image and move her here. This essential area. I don't know if Photoshop has a very good sort of um so I'm just trying to duplicate it make it look more like a painting I know painter has that option but um so let's say that the details aren't as much but it's still working and it still looks like the person has painted this in there. It's not 100% a photograph, but it is representing the same thing. And you see how they're very duplicate, even though I took out probably 50, 30, 70, let's say 30%, 70 left, 30% of the detail is gone. More than more than 30% of the detail. What's wrong with my brain? More than 30% of the detail is gone, but it's still representing the same thing. But if we zoom up, we see the messy work. We see the real work. But it doesn't matter because it's still representing it. If you're at this point here, what's the difference between this and a photograph? If this is a painting, let's say this is a painting. What's the difference between it and a photograph? If you paint so well that, the, that you're a photorealist and you no longer have that sort of you don't you no longer show that you see values and what's the point you're just duplicating you're just a computer at that point a printer so that's what I'm trying to tell you if you over render you can possibly lose details if you're not using a photograph if you over render you lose the details you're like oh no this tree bark is very messy let me over render it a little bit let me add in a little bit of extra lines and see what I can do this is someone that's over rendering so they have these um tree bark strokes and what they're doing is at this point they want to make it look a little bit better so let me add in a little bit more light just to make it work they zoom in and this is what all of you do and I know you do it and they just start shading as if as if they're a hundred percent zoomed out you're not zoomed out at this point what you're doing is you're shading something you can't even see in full how can you expect yourself to be able to shade what this image looks like if you're not zoomed out and see what happens you lose detail here this is what happens this is an explanation sort of I'm trying to get as close as possible um, but this is what you guys do you guys zoom in unnecessarily the most you need to zoom in probably is up to here and the most you can zoom in is probably when the image is no longer visible <laughs> but you need to zoom out this much at least as much as I'm zoomed out right now at uh, um, in order to be able to create a convincing value shift and that's sort of the next thing shifting values approaching knowing which sides are light and which sides are dark and um, that's what's difficult that's what needs you to start building your visual library because how the heck are you supposed to know how the sun you know works with this so let's try to duplicate sunlight on this you know impressionist style
Impressionists did use references. They were outside most of the time. So it looks like a very, very furry tree. <laughs> but bear with me, please. And right now I'm trying not to render, I'm trying to be messy, be random, just like the world is outside. And essentially that's what Impressionism was all about. It was trying to capture the mess of things. It was trying to capture what things really look like in our eyes when we look at them. Do we focus on all that detail or do we just remember the general shapes of it? And when we squint our eyes we can practically see a realistic image in those pictures. So let's try to create create a sort of suggestive tree branch in the impressionist way, which is the suggestive way. So I showed you way number one, which is to use very textured brush after you've sort of planned out the piece, measured out how the image looks, and um, and gone in. But what 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 uh, what these professionals do is they don't plan their drawings. They don't really uh, spend that much time planning where they're going to put this big machine. What they do is they freestyle. So when you freestyle, you have to start having a bit more confidence in your lines and not over-render. So far, do we have any questions? Make it a Lorax tree. Anyone have any questions? Okay, I'll go on. So when you do these kinds of things, um, you don't... Um, uh, uh, okay, go ahead, Nazir. Uh, what you have to start doing in order to know where which areas to render is you have to start drawing trying to draw accurate representations of the tree. So trying to draw a an accurate tree shape. So when you freestyle, you're not just going in there and drawing a curvy tree like I'm doing right now. Try to draw a tree that has edges. Try to draw a tree that has three dimensions. Try to draw a tree that has a sort of uh, geometric quality to it. And when you paint areas like this let's look at this this grass area you're not painting it as one large brush stroke and leaving it at that no you're trying to discover as much detail through that just with general brush strokes and adding adding that extra little um, brush stroke here shows that there is grass behind it I'm sorry if I sound a bit stuffy I did get medicine and I hope it starts working faster the second I took it, it started working. So yay for antibiotics. And nay for colds. So let's try to create some sort of um, representative shape of a tree branch. Have extra tree branches here that are peeking through we sort of get something that looks a bit like a tree. And this works if you, if you spend a little bit more time on it. And of course, uh, this was 10 minutes or something. So, you know, uh, usually a speedy is an hour or an hour and a half. And I know that seems like a lot, but in, 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 in art world, that's very little amount of time to draw something. So just keep trying to, to see where you can place them. Don't just place them anywhere you want. See where you can place them. instead of detailing all that crazy realism. We're not here to be photorealists. We're here to give employers what they want, give our inspiration, what, what it wants when we want to paint something. And if we want to build a style, we're going to have to start understanding all the rules. And Impressionism is the perfect example of someone who has learned all the rules and known which ones to break. Remember all that, that, that entire Picasso thing I talked to you about? He learned all the rules and knew which ones to break and he created a very impressionist, they call it data, they call it all that crap, but it's impressionist. Um, and abstract they call it, but it's still impressionist. Sort of approach to painting. Don't render too much. Try 
try to approach it from a from zoomed out perspective and then understand values through that. And you have at your disposal uh, a lot of tools digitally. Um, so take advantage of that. A lot of tools that will help you get the job done. Nazir, do you have any questions? I was somewhat asking how to find out how to pick useful brushes, but then there's probably no cure against that. You just got to play around and find out, right? Yes, um, it's not that there's no cure. Um, there's no such thing as a cure in art. Nothing is, is there's no shortcut to anything. Everything requires application, and you personally should choose your own brushes to work with you in your own way. But you don't have a style yet. No one, none of us have a style yet. So how are you supposed to choose your own brushes? Well, again, experimentation. You have to go through all the brushes you want. Make sure that you have more brushes than you need. And that's the best thing that I could tell you, Nazir. Always have more brushes than you need. At least have a hundred brushes covered in different kinds of textures and play with them and see which one you like. I know there's a, a brush that I have that's not meant for snow, but the way I paint snow or the way I see snow as I'm building my style, the more I grow as an artist, I know that it can help me with snow with the way I approach snow. There's some brushes here that don't, they're not supposed to be used for terrain, they're not supposed to be used for uh, for mountainsides, but I use them for hair, um, and uh, that's sort of my understanding of how hair works. No dristy, don't use the round brush. Last thing <laughs> you should use is the round brush. Do not settle for the Photoshop basic brushes, you need more than that. Males can use the guy brush. <laughs> um, I'm sorry if there's lags. I'm very sorry. Um, I don't know what it is today. Our internet. I don't know what's going on. Okay, so does everyone understand um, these two methods? The number one is if you're sort of painting and you're uh, three, four hours into your painting and you have a... Um, you have a nice pretty you know landscape and then you have a sun, sun, sun there and you have some clouds and you have a sort of grass here grass texture and the grass texture right now the grass just looks like um, green ice cream at this point because you guys don't know how to render the detail so you just have like a nice little green and then you have a nice little light green going on to make the Actually, some of you don't even use a textured brush for this. This brush is kind of working. And this is basically what your what your hills look like. Okay, what I was going to talk to you about is colors, how to get detail through color. Now, Leventep, his, his work isn't just a bunch of gray scaled awesomeness. His, his, his work has a degree of color in it. Maybe not those gray scale ones, but he does have a lot of color. And what he has are muted colors. Let's look at this one. This one's practically grayscale. But the degree of color that he's introduced works well with us. I'll try to make some Ista brushes. I'm um, not sure yet. I have to talk to my developers on that. I don't have any Ista brushes thus far. I did make some brushes, but, uh, but I don't think they're very good. They're very amateur. Uh, I don't know how to make them sort of continue and twist with the art pen. I still need to still need to develop those but look at the amount of color that he's used and how it works and look at how the values are working with it and look at the purples that he has in the shadows Do you guys notice these purples do you guys notice the yellows and the light um, these are the tiny little things that make the biggest difference in impressionism and that's technically what it means when you zoom out it looks like that brush stroke took you four minutes to finish because you were sort of had the dark parts of the brush stroke and the light parts of the brush stroke. But when you zoom in, you realize it's just one brush stroke and it probably took you less than a second to do it. But that's the point of impressionism. It's strategic application of brush strokes. 
It's very, very uh, premeditated, professional. I hate using that word because it's so general and it doesn't explain itself. But a very intelligent <laughs> way of placing your uh, brush strokes. And your brush isn't going to do everything for you. Don't get me wrong. A textured brush isn't going to paint your picture for you. Never, never, never do that. Uh, a textured brush would uh, would only assist you in decreasing the amount of time you have to apply. And you still have to edit that brush. As you paint over it, you have to go back and edit areas that are repeating, areas that aren't matching the contours, areas that are pushing down while the image is pushing up, areas that are lighter, you have to edit those. Never you, you use a raw brush stroke. You can tell it from far away that it doesn't match the rest of your style. It's just someone else's brush stroke doing something else. Lola's brushes and Lola's perfect brushes. <laughs> Did you get her brushes? Yeah, and those Lola's brushes, um, those like half of those I I made. The ones that have weird names are the ones that I made. There's ones that are I have used somewhere else that I've edited. So I've added transfer, I've added double brush, I've downloaded them and played with them and added them back in. Um, so I don't know some of the I have no idea which ones because I just spent a whole week on brushes one time. But um, but they are on the uh, on the Dropbox page, which is on my DeviantArt. DeviantArt seems so immature, but okay. So do you guys see how the level of color is working for him? So let's get back to this ice cream hill that we have here. So right, right now it looks like green ice cream. Why? Because in our zoomed away point, we didn't think about that we're supposed to be doing as much detail as possible at this point. Right now we're telling ourselves in our, in our brain, hey, hey, don't do so much detail. You're going to zoom in soon and you're going to do the detail there. What are you going to do when you zoom in? You're going to do this? Is that what you're going to do when you zoom in? That's not enough. It's going to look okay. It's going to get a brush stroke in for you, but but it's not going to do it. It's not going to do it for you. You're going to lose values. You're going to lose these values here. What are you going to do? Get a lighter one? A lighter white and just start brushing. I know some of you are saying yeah, <laughs> but that's not what you're supposed to be doing. It still looks artificial. When you zoom out, it still looks artificial. And the way to achieve a, a, a well laid out grass texture is to write when you're in the distance view, right when you're zoomed out, you're applying as much detail as possible. Don't depend on zooming in to do your details for you. Do your details from over here. So would the sun shine this much on this side of the hill? No, it wouldn't. This hill would be lighter because it's more distant. Let's add in some blue. A nice gentle blue to match. Okay, let's darken that blue a little bit near the bottom. Okay, this grass here is not really matching. This whole hill here is in a shadow state, so it's not really being exposed that much. Let's draw another hill in the background. And let's keep this impressionist as if it's a speed painting. I'll try my best not to suck. And let's get a nice light yellow for the sun. Okay, so let's say this is our speed painting and we want to create detail. We're stuck at this point, we want to add detail. How the heck do I add detail? The way you add detail is you start understanding the values. Go back to Levin Tep's piece. How is he managing detail? Well, he's managing detail through this uh, sort of surface texture that he's working with. Some of his brushes he's repeating. He's got some mountain brushes, I mean uh, some metal brushes, some uh, some sort of building brushes that he's placed in some areas he's erased. Um, some areas he just made lines. And then he used the sharpen tool, I believe, just to bring out some of those shapes. But the colors here, the colors are sort of building in. The, this contrast of colors between the white and the dark shows that there's the, there's a surface that is capturing the light, a surface that is different in texture than the surface beneath it. So a metallic surface capturing the light from the sky. So back to our little amateur painting. We have to understand where to apply these. So we'll go back to the color wheel. Where to apply these laws in our painting. and how to keep textures going. 
And the way textures keep going is by keeping yourself zoomed out and keeping the values darkened. So that you approach a very uh, a picture that's covered all information required for the eyes to understand what's going on. And the way you add the texture is you have to understand first what kind of texture is required. So we have a very uneven texture and what you can do is one, get a grass brush and edit it and make sure you're not sort of overdoing it with that brush. And two, go in and brush, brush them yourself. But that sort of takes away from time and we are working digitally. Just keep rendering and understanding that there are different levels of this hill that are capturing different kinds of light. And there are probably even more levels in the distance. And the way you approach these is by understanding that there is a degree of, of detail you have to do before you go in any further. And if you don't, uh, uh, if you don't apply these details, you'll get an image that doesn't read when you zoom out. Because some of you, I don't know if you guys have reached this stage yet, I know you guys, some of you have, but there are some artists that when you zoom out, the image looks like it's finished, and when you zoom in, it doesn't look like it's finished, but it's very difficult to duplicate that. Um, it sort of, I, I realized that one time, and I was like, how do I get that? How do I do that? How do I place the darks in the exact right spots so that it looks good? And that's the point of not zooming out. As soon as I started zooming out, I started getting a more readable painting from the distance. And keep zooming out, keep trying to create a sort of organic oh, I'm sorry brain lapse, like organic representation of a grassy field. And when you apply your, your brushes, um, you know now if you zoom in, so this is basically what I'm trying to give you as an exemplar, you know now when you zoom in that you're not supposed to blend this here, because what we do is we over render, and we, we sort of blend this here, when we zoom out, that land variation is gone now, it just looks smooth. But before I did that, it had a nice little variation on it, which is required. So that's what I'm telling you to do. Beware of that over-rendering problem. What you can do when you zoom in is simply start brushing in the grass. That's all you can do. You can't do anything else. You have to work with the value bubble you're in. If you're in this value bubble, you can't go this dark because you've destroyed the values you've created when you're far away. And that's how you create um, convincing, zoomed out, but with enough detail, speed drawings. You can't destroy the values you established when you were using far away. Hey Michael, hey Ben. Bon, I think it's just, um, so you would do the surface, do you do the structure and overall colors before using the perfect texture brushes? Um, yes, of course. Um, that's one way. Uh, to get a, a general texture, that matches wherever you go, you have to you choose one brush to paint with from the beginning. Of course, you're not going to use a basic Photoshop brush. Um, what I used is this brush to get my painting started. I'm sorry about the quality of painting, I'm just trying to explain as fast as possible. So this is a brush I chose. It has very geometric um, shape, but then it has nice details if you zoom it in, if you zoom if you zoom it out. If you zoom it in, it's got a nice little, it's got a nice little um, textured line quality. So that's why it makes it easier for me to go and zoom in. So you have to get a really good brush to get you through your painting. But if you want, um, you can start using a the same brush right when you start and not, not, fit, not use any other brush if it can do it for you. I'm going to be adding a, a texture in a second. And what I meant by perfect brushes, the way I made them, is because they're absolutely perfect for the surface textures they, they're, they're designed for. 
Is that brush from the Lula brush pack? No, um, I'll be giving it to you if you guys want it. It's a really good brush. Okay, so I'm not. Tr I'm trying not to disrupt. And I'm creating a very general sort of surface texture for the grass. I'm gonna sort of go in with my with my sharpen tool and just sharpen a bit of that grass. And I can even do the grass from far away. It's just that you can't see the brush and it makes your eyes hurt. And I just realized I'm not wearing my glasses. I'll smudge it out, but it's okay. And then you can just keep brushing in a very, very um, messy sort of, that you don't have to be neat about it. Just make sure that you're getting the general image when before you zoom back in. So don't over render. Do you see how this dark spot here is still a dark spot? Do you see how this light spot is still a light spot? Do you see that? Do you guys, do you guys understand what I'm saying? When I say I didn't blend this with this and this at all. Why I didn't do that is because when I zoom in, I have a, I have this overwhelming need to blend. So what I do is I zoom out. Zoom out so you guys don't blend too much. That little change from the dark to the light is actually helping this painting. It's helping this painting read well when you zoom out. It's showing that, oh, there's a surface variation here. Oh, things aren't perfect in, in, in Greenland. You know, grass isn't perfectly flat. And I, I, and I believe that. My eyes believe that because when I go to a park and I look out, there isn't the same green shade all over the grass. No, there's a shitload of different green shades. There's brown, there's yellow, there's red. And so what you guys have to understand is that when you create a painting of grass or a tree or a leaf, you have to know which areas to blend, which areas not to blend, which areas can be represented through impressionism, which areas require a, sh a bit more detail, like a shade darker and which areas need a little bit less detail and they don't need that much. So the sky is known as an area where it doesn't need that much detail but grass requires a little bit more detail. So this is enough grass shading for me for this drawing. I don't plan on painting every single blade of grass. I'm just getting a very general texture. When I... one second. Sorry, um, just people here laugh like apes. <laughs> Sorry, where was I? Um, so at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a blade of grass or a, or a grass friendly texture. Hey, Bazaar, how are you? Welcome. Okay, so this one is a pretty good texture brush for grass. Okay, so this is this is my favorite grass brush. What this is going to do for me, number one, it gives me scatter. It gives me organic scatter. Number two, it gives me blade surface texture, and it gives me um, it gives me a uh, size variation. So it's not the same size all over. So this is my favorite grass brush uh, texture that I've used for. Um, let me show you which one I used it for, just to prove that it really does work. And if you guys want it, it's in my it's in my um, Okay, so I've used it for the bag end picture. I've also used it for the Excalibur picture. Do you see how convincing the grass looks when you use that? And I didn't achieve this grass look without the sharpen tool. And what happens is that you lose a lot of uh, a texture um, when you don't use the grass tool. No, this is not crit. This is just me trying to show you how to use the brushes. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to brush this over trying not to disturb the values that I established before. This brush is a little bit crazy though. Likes to make its own rules. You have to keep sort of and 
sharpen. This is just, just generally my basic um, method to make grass. And of course I would darken. And then what I do at that point is I try to, again, don't leave the brushes exactly as they are. I have a good amount of detail right now. What I'm going to do is go back to my normal brush that I started the painting with and fix the rowdiness of this brush. So what I do is I go back, fix areas that I don't want, and try not to disturb the values. Try to create that texture. And again, we're impressionist painters if we're doing very uh, quick drawings. We're trying not to do too much detail, just something that suggests that sort of level of detail. So suggestive, suggestive painting. Sorry about the quality of the painting. I'm just trying to show you it fast enough so I can get to the critiques. And that's basically my process of how to get details in a good amount of time without disturbing the values and keeping something looking like it is a grass field. And what I did with, with this one, just to run you through it, is that it's, it did start off as grayscale because I had no idea what I was working with and it was a bit of a matte painting. So this entire area here was a photograph and this area here was a photograph and the rest was all painting. So it was all duplication of the texture. So what I did was I used a textured brush, I tried to get the values and I sharpened, 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 sharpened. I didn't stop sharpening. Each stage had a different level of sharpening. Uh, matte painting is when you're using photographs to assist um, in the painting process. So sometimes you paint over a photograph, sometimes you paint over a video, and sometimes you put different photographs together in like a collage kind of thing. So this is sort of what I did. And to get the grass texture, do you see how there are levels in the, in the value I didn't touch? Do you see how here this area stayed dark but this area stayed light to suggest that the light was shining in this area but it was still part of the downward movement of the hill? Um, okay, Saru, I'll take a look at it now. Um, can you send it to me uh, through Skype, if that's okay? Uh, distance means less detail. Yes, distance means less detail, but it doesn't mean less value. If, you, if you're going to draw a hill from far away, it has to look like a hill. It, just because it's far away it doesn't mean it has to look like a, a little bulge or a little ice cream um, or something like that. You have to make sure that the values are different, that, the, that, that that hill has a dark side, that hill has a light side, that hill has to... Um, uh, it's okay, Saru. That hill has to represent that it is a hill from far away. And it still has a degree of detail in it. You can represent them through speckling. You can represent them through spots, um, through different uh, just brushes of your, uh, strokes of your brush. For that one is the same idea. Um, very general shapes on top of different uh, texture um, things. And then this one, the, the bag end one, that you see when you zoom in, that it just looks like a bunch of dots, but when you zoom out, it does look like a tree. It does look like a surface area of, of grass. The distance, the, 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 the hill from far away, do you see the hill from far away here? I should probably get the, the good quality version of that. Let me see if I can. Bag. Okay, that doesn't work on. Okay, do you see how this hill, hill here still looks like a grassy hill? Even though it's far away, even though it doesn't make any significant detail difference. But it, the, the surface area still has levels and degrees of value that we're not losing out on. I don't know why it's doing this. It looks very different on, on thing, but I don't know. Different pictures change. P pictures change in the medium that's showing it. But do you guys see what I mean with detail? How you don't have to render. Some of you guys are asking me, and the reason why I did the class today is you, you guys are asking me, how do I render detail? How do I get into that and start rendering? You don't need to over render. That's the lesson. That's the moral of the story. You don't need to push into this realistic area here that makes absolutely no real difference to the quality of your painting style. This level here, where everything is realistic and everything is perfect. You don't need this level of art. Um, what you do need, though, is enough information that we can see what's going on. So enough information here. This is where you need to be. Level 
when if things look 100% realistic and level zero, where there's nothing on your canvas, you need to be in the middle to represent that as a draw a picture of a woman smiling with a headdress on. Okay, and that's technically what I'm trying to tell you. That's it. Don't over render. You don't need that much detail. Your brushes can do it for you. So if you had a picture of a tree here and you wanted to add a little bit more detail on it, there are a lot of brushes that can do that for you. So that second, that first technique that I showed you where you can use a, um, let's see if I can find it here. So this is one of my favorite brushes. This brush here, it's in the brush set that I gave you guys. This brush set is beautiful, beautiful, sort of, it represents value change very, very well. And what I do is I use this brush to give me some detail on the tree and make sure that your values are the same. So what I do is I drop tool the color I want to change and just throw this brush on top. Of course, remember guys, this is all digital. I'm not teaching you how to make it traditionally, but in traditional, you'll just get a stippling brush that looks just like this when you brush it on, and you start brushing it on top. Same idea, it's just that this time it's a digital medium. And this is sort of one of one of the brushes that can give you, this is one of the possibilities that can give you good detail on your brush. And again, reignite that the power of that brush by going into your sharpen tool and bringing out those details. So do you see how these details are coming out? And this is in the brush set that I gave you guys. It's in the Dropbox. If it's not in the Dropbox, please let me know. I did remove them. I don't know if I put them back in. Sorry if you hear gorillas in the background. We're sort of getting a detailed, try not to disturb the values, keeping everything in its respective realm, and we're getting some sort of details. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me try another brush that does this as well. This is a really, really good, this is sort of a mountain range brush, but it, it works for me for, for details. So remember that brush is there too, and then we have this three-year-old's drawing. <laughs> Just shows how my brain doesn't work when I explain. Okay, this is really nice scatter brush. Try not to disturb the values. It'll, it is a bit of a crazy brush. It'll it'll. One second. Sorry guys, and um, just keep using that same brush. Different kinds of brushes can give you different kinds of tree textures, and then you can go in and render. But make sure the point of the story is don't over render. Preserve your values, and that way you get something that looks like a speed painting. And this just looks like a, it looks like a speed painting. Now I'm just going to brush a, a sharpen tool over top to refine my brushes. Because what happens is I set my 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 detail my brush on transfer. When it's on transfer, if I don't brush hard, it comes out as a soft version of the brush. So I don't like that, but I like the transfer, so I compensate by using the, the sharpen tool in the end. And that's that basically looks like a tree. You zoom out, even though it looks like a crappy tree, it still looks like a tree. It still looks like, yeah, as crappy as it is, <laughs> I hope you understand my method, um, it still looks like a tree. And when you zoom in, you see all the messy work. You see how everything doesn't actually look like leaves. And it's okay if it doesn't, because who has the time to paint every freaking leaf on the tree? And that's okay, because you as artists are impressionists. This is a suggestive way of painting. 